This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. According to Professor Albert Einstein's famous theory of relativity, if your bedroom alarm clock were put into a spaceship traveling at near the speed of light, it would tick more slowly. And as if that were not enough, the science of physics also agrees that if a 12-inch foot ruler were moving through space at 90% of the speed of light, it would be only 6 inches long instead of 12. Now, all this may sound utterly absurd, and yet these are accepted principles of contemporary physics. Humankind are just beginning to understand the incredible mysteries of this universe. Scientists are discovering that material physical reality is not nearly as simple as it one time seemed. This universe was designed and was planned by a mind far more majestic than humanity at one time imagined. And yet, by living faith, your mind can come to know this very mind of God. The mind of the God who created all that is, who loves you, and who is your father and your friend, if you will have the faith to believe it. The faith to accept the fact that you are accepted. You're part of all this universe of things and meanings and values. You may be able to recognize yourself in a mirror, but that does not mean you know who you are. Just because you can pick yourself out in a group photograph does not signify that you fully are conscious of your real identity, because your real identity is spiritual, and you will never be fully content until you come to know the living God who loves you and has a will and a way for your life. The great Russian author Leo Tolstoy once described a man sitting in a boat which had been pushed off from an unknown shore. He's been shown the opposite shore. That man has been given a pair of oars and then left to himself. Straight out into the stream he rose. But then the current gets hold of him and deflects him. Other boats are there. Some have thrown their oars away. A few are struggling against the stream. Most are gliding with the water quite content to do nothing. Is this the way, he asks one of them. A chorus of voices replies, of course it's the way. What do you think? There can be no other way. And so he drifts on down the stream. But then gradually he grows conscious of a sound, menacing, terrible, the roar of the rapids. And suddenly this man comes to himself, remembers what he had forgotten, the oars, the course that he was to take, the opposite shore, frantically begins to row upstream against the current, crying out to himself, fool that I was to drift and drift. So the man rows on until safety is achieved. And now, writes Tolstoy, may I explain that that current is the tradition of this world. The oars are human free will, and the opposite shore is the finding of God. Where is your life going? Have you taken charge of your direction? of your purpose, your intent. Do you know, really, why you are here, where you came from, where you're going? God has a plan for this planet and a purpose for your life, which can energize, which can animate your every waking moment in your sleeping moments as well, because the Spirit of God can work within your mind, within your consciousness, with your will, your decisions, your plans, your thinking about the future, can adjust and transform your inner life and once your inner life is thus renovated, your outer life will be transformed as well because you cannot remain as you are when you give your life wholeheartedly to the living God. In his book, God the Invisible King, H.G. Wells wrote, Religion is the first thing and the last thing, and until a man has found God, he begins at no beginning and he works to no end. Wells writes, life falls into place only with God, who fights through man against blind force and might and non-existence, who fights with man against the confusion and evil within and without and against death in any form. The God who loves us as a great captain loves his men and stands ready to use us in his immortal adventure against waste and disorder, cruelty and vice, who is the end and who is the means. End of quote. God is the everlasting Father of all and cares with a parent's love for his sons and daughters. 
The important thing is you can know. You can feelingly experience in your own life, in your own soul, this love of God, this forgiveness of God, this newness. If only you would awaken to the reality of it. There was a wise spiritual teacher named George MacDonald who once preached to the Englishman of his time, you're like little children sitting on the curbstone, hunting in the gutter for things. He said, behind you is a king's palace, finer even than Buckingham, and in it your father sits. But you won't listen. You won't even turn around to look. He said, you just keep on hunting in the gutter for things, and it doesn't matter whether it's rotten vegetables or pennies or shillings you find there. They can never make you happy without your father. That is the living truth. There is no real happiness in human life apart from spiritual growth. Jesus began his Sermon on the Mount with the word blessed or happy. His religion resounds with a reverberating sense of joy, of gladness in being alive, of the sheer glee in knowing at long last who you really are, who you were created to be, that you have a place here. You can feel at home in this universe, which is your home, and you can come to the first-hand experience of that. I heard a story that on one occasion an old Hindu sage had been watching a Christian closing his eyes to pray, and when he was finished, the Hindu said, Why is it that you seem to be so anxious to see God with your eyes closed? The Hindu said, learn also to see God with your eyes open in the poor, the starved, the illiterate, the afflicted. For these too are sons and daughters of God. And See God in the sun and the moon and the stars. This is not pantheism to which I call us, but rather the celebration of God's creative energy in all that is. For God is the source and center of creation, and without God there would be nothing that is. Therefore, celebrate God in all that you experience. Marching down through the ages, men and women have wondered what God might be, how God works, what the human duty to God is. To many Orientals of early times, God was a being far removed from the earth without much concern for humankind. Pagan religions had deities connected with fertility. The Greeks thought of God as mind, wisdom, beauty. Some thought of God as a vague moral consciousness. Others conceived of God as energy. And there was some truth in all of this. But not enough really to make God truly attractive, to inspire people's devotion and allegiance to God. People were hungry for a better God than any pagan religion could offer. And they found just such a God as they craved in one whose name was love, the God who is a father and a friend. God is not the absentee landlord of earth. God is not only ruler, judge, regulator of the stars and planets. God is love. God is the loving heartbeat of this universe. All of God's activity is the activity of love. Everything God does is inspired by love. He creates and rules and judges in love. God is love. All, everything God does is done in love. Everything God will do with and in your life will be done in love. The desire of the greatest possible good for you, for that is the very nature of love, desiring good. Do you remember the story from the life of Jesus? Back in Bethany, we read, while Jesus was in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of most expensive perfume, and poured it on his head as he was at the table. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. One of them said, What's the point of such a wicked waste? Couldn't this perfume have been sold for a great deal of money, and then the proceeds given away to the poor? Jesus perceived what they were saying, and he spoke to them. Why must you make this woman feel uncomfortable this way? She's done a beautiful thing for me. You have the poor with you always, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she was preparing it for my burial. I tell you plainly that wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, this act of hers will also be told in memory of her. Jesus knew that even if what that woman did was lavish and extravagant, her motive was the important thing, and her motive was the very highest. It was love. Jesus was more concerned about human motives than anything else. 
But Jesus said, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was lonely, and you made me welcome. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was ill, and you came and looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to see me there. And people asked, But when did we see you hungry and give you food? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you lonely and make you welcome, or see you naked and clothe you, or see you ill or in prison and go to see you? And Jesus said, I assure you, Whatever you did for the least of these, my brothers, you have done to me. The motive is what is vital. If you feel discontented with your life, and if you try to find happiness by the pursuit of pleasure, it is as if you attempted to quench your thirst by drinking salt water. The more you consume, the more you will thirst. For mere physical pleasure can only please you. It cannot satisfy you, really deeply, truly satisfy you. Only finding and knowing God can really satisfy you. There's a question which a number of letters to this broadcast have asked. If God is the loving Father of all people, if all people are brothers and sisters in one family of God, if God does freely forgive people, then why have faith? Why is faith necessary? If all people already are loved... Forgiveness is available, sonship with God, daughterhood with God. Why is it necessary to claim these things by whole-souled belief and trust in these things? Some people wonder, people are children of God. Why have religion at all? Why recognize or acknowledge that fact? Well, suppose you were getting ready to prepare a meal at lunchtime, and somebody saw that your refrigerator was all full of food, your larder was plenteously provided, and your cupboards were well stocked, and suppose that person said, wait a minute, you already have all these good things, they're yours, why bother to eat them? Why is it necessary to consume them? They already belong to you, they're paid for. You would reply, it is not enough that you have them, you must use them, you desire to partake of them. It is not enough that this food is yours, you want to taste it and be nourished by it and strengthened by it. So with these good things of the spiritual life, until you begin to live daily in love and prayer and worship of God, you're never really going to taste and feelingly experience these things and be nourished by them. Faith is the act of using that which God has already given to you, which is there as close as your next breath is a new experience of the reality of God which can totally transform your life. If only in this moment you will dare to have the faith to claim it and live as the son or daughter of God, you really are. Write to us, will you, at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute. We want to hear from you wherever you're listening on this world, to this great global broadcast, to the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's Box 3080, 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, for free literature. Just write in, tell us what your problem is or what you're thinking about, what you're dealing with. We want to hear from you and correspond with you. Write to Box 3080, Oakhurst, California. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell that mailing address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T. California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.